hi, and welcome to our session. I'm Kelly Hill, Executive Editor of RCR Wireless News. I'm joined today by Jim Newins, who is Vice President and General Manager of Wireless Field Instruments at Biavi Solutions, and Stefan Richter, who is Head of the Department for Local Networks and Private Networks at German System Integrator Mugler. How are you this morning, gentlemen? Or this afternoon, as, as it might be for our European crowd. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are here to talk about real world deployment experiences in, uh, in private networks. And both of you are here to, to offer us some expert insights on that. And so I just wanna start off with, you know, really getting to, you know, what are some of the real life pain points that you see customers dealing with as they're deploying private networks and, and how are you helping to address them? And, uh, and Stefan, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, um, good morning uh, or good afternoon um, to the audience and also to you, Kelly and uh, Jim. Yeah, so what are the, the pain points uh, on customer side um, uh, why they uh, would deploy a private network? So we, we can uh, differentiate uh, in general three categories or three main uh, aspects. So the first one is a reduction of cabling costs. So there are many uh, applications um, who needs um, actually uh, cables, but um, yeah, the efforts for cabling um, yeah is um, increasing um, by the costs, and um, also um, here uh, are some um, dependencies uh, with um, the improved mobility, for example, for automated manufacturing robots. And uh, connecting with the uh, private five G system could reduce overall the the cabling cost. The second aspect is uh, the realization of new applications. So uh, in context with uh, industry 4.0, we see many applications, for example, um, on, the, on the logistical side, uh, who can uh, improve the processes uh, for the automotive industry, for example. So that means uh, controlled fleets of AGVs uh, require uh, uh, very uh, per, um, um, yeah, performant and also secure mobile infrastructure and that could be reached by a, a private network. The third aspect is, um, yeah, many customers try to complement or replace existing wireless technology. In many cases, there is a desire to replace TECT, for example. And uh, in other um, aspects, we see Wi-Fi is to be supplemented with new technology for uh, critical applications. So these are the three most uh, important uh, points, uh, pain points we see actually, and we address that uh, points um, that we can be the partner for potential customers um, to bring the uh, complete uh, the tel um, uh, tel complete services to um, uh, potential interest groups. Yeah. And Jim, what do you see from the VIV Solutions side? Yeah, so maybe a little bit on the testing perspective and, and maybe taking a little different spin on the question. As I see the early deployments, what are some of the issues that they're, that they're dealing with in the early deployments? So first and foremost, I think is uh, in, in a multi-vendor environment, uh, regression testing and managing the release schedules between multiple vendors, uh, dealing with the regression testing, integration testing, and even conformance testing aspects. This is, you know, not only uh, under a loaded environment, but it includes all the front halls and back hall. Uh, really getting a handle on on how you're going to deploy new software in a live network without disrupting. Kind of like flying an airplane at 35,000 feet and and uh, trying to change out, you know, the oil or changing the engine, for example. And then the other angle is on the assurance side. So this is the first time that we've had wireless networks that actually will have service level agreements driven around them. And how do we manage that? How do we test that? And how do we more importantly assure that, that not only the SLA validation, but quality of experience, right? That Wi-Fi in an enterprise environment was, um, you know, probably a little bit stronger than best effort. It wasn't mission critical in many cases. And here we see the wireless technology transitioning into mission critical aspects of the business. Those are some of the key areas and pain points that we'd expect to see going forward. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Stefan, I'm gonna ask uh, if you could sort of outline, you know, as businesses are considering and, and thinking about deployment, you know, can you talk about what the pre-deployment planning process looks like, you know, for a private cellular network? Um, you know, what are some of the ways that this differs from Wi-Fi? 
Um, yeah, in general, um, we, we can see two different approaches. So um, let me let me tell you how uh, we go forward in the project um, uh, by deploying a private 5G network. Most important issue is um, to do a radio network planning uh, to get best coverage with the required performance. So that means every every private network is in general unique uh, as it's uh, is it's tailor made to the use cases so um, first task is um, the clarification of the purpose of the private network and also the analysis of the use cases that means um, we analyze um, the key performance indicators um, slas and such things then we start with the spectrum clearance that means we check the frequency bands for regulatory uh, constraints or restrictions and furthermore, we do a site survey to check the general conditions of cabling and mounting and the facilities. And uh, we also um, locate potential interferers. Um, so that is uh, the most important thing here before we do the um, uh, finally step. So the radio network planning, uh, which is um, software based and aims to determine which cells are required and where. Uh, to get the desired coverage. So after installation, the KPIs must be proven with an acceptance test. Um, this procedure includes um, verification of the network performance. Um, so what could be achieved in real use with the network? And uh, that means um, here we have some functional testing aspects like uh, measurement of latency, throughput, also handover testing. Uh, the approach um, uh, for for wi deploying Wi-Fi networks is a bit um, um, different. So in general, the, uh, so, um, um, the 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 procedure is much much easier, and that uh, means that the radio network planning is not done frequently. Typically, an estimation of access points is done, which will be verified with the measurements uh, on the campus after the de 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 deployment process. That means. Um, in, in comparison, um, by deploying private 5G networks, it's a bit uh, more effort uh, for the, uh, before the deployment, uh, but at the end, we will receive uh, much better um, quality, um, uh, especially uh, coverage and performance um, as the customer requires. Okay. Um, Jim, it sounds like... <clears throat> Sounds like there's a lot of testing yeah. <laughs> over the course of that process. I'm wondering if you can sort of break down for us some of the, the specific testing requirements uh, during that deployment process that that support planning. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that Stefan did a great job um, for sure, right? Uh, and I and I characterize them in three categories. One is spectrum coexistence, which includes not only interference mitigation but testing for interference and clearance, uh, as well as coverage. And, and then with the coverage, then you also have, as I talked about in the previous question, SLA validation on that RF environment once you start getting uh, deployment going. Right? So, so those aspects are very, very important and must be done because this is an engineered network. It's designed to work at load. This isn't a network that when it gets loaded, everybody's service is reduced. That's not the way this works. This is designed to work at load and it must be validated at load to be very clear. The, the other aspect is around uh, the, the WAN connection, right? And, and, and so this is all tethered to uh, potentially other, other local networks, other uh, private 5G networks to create a virtual LAN environment. And that, that WAN connection also, uh, depending on how well that's working, will, will impact your performance and impact your ability to meet your SLAs. And so that WAN connection is also a piece of this. It's always underserved, but a very critical aspect that needs to be tested. Okay. Um, Stefan, you mentioned spectrum clearing. Um, and, and I know you folks are sort of in a, in a unique position there in Germany where uh, the government has specifically set aside spectrum for private networks. Um, you know, what spectrum do you see customers wanting to make use of? You know, are they trying to, uh, are they typically using licensed spectrum? Are they using unlicensed, um, you know, low, mid or high bands? Um, you know, what do you see playing out in the field? Um, yeah, that, that's uh, very clear. You, you, you mean um, um, we have a unique position here in Germany and that means we, we have um, the opportunity for customers that they can um, yeah, have an application for the um, frequency bands um, they uh, want to use. So that means we have two options here in Germany. 
um, for for setting up a private um, network, um, which is only in the in the light sense spectrum. So, uh, in the sub six gigahertz band N seventy eight, the so called industry spectrum here in Germany, we have um, uh, hundred megahertz. Um, and uh, the second option is. Um, to have um, um, up to 800 megahertz in the MM band and seven, uh, 257, so uh, it's on uh, 26 gigahertz. Um, these, these are the uh, both opportunities we have here in Germany. And uh, as we see it in other uh, areas here in, in, uh, within the world, um, some, some countries try to adapt these um, opportunities here for um, their companies. Actually, we have in, in Germany 250 companies uh, with frequency assignments and additionally the same amount of users for R&D purposes. So that means uh, more than 500 um, um, yeah, potential um, private networks here in Germany. Okay. Um, Jim, any, any, yeah. any thoughts on expanding that you know, from, the, from the broader Viavi view of, uh, of where, what you see yeah. around the world? Yeah, yeah. So in the US, we're seeing a small bit of high band or millimeter wave. And also Japan. Japan has a significant amount of millimeter wave uh, uh, deployments going on and in the manufacturing environment as well, right? So um, where, where they can get this constrained so they can get through the coverage aspect of it. And then the performance is, is very attractive to many people. So we do see some high band elsewhere in the world. Huh. Interesting, all right. Yep. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about the handset and equipment market um, and how you see that shaping up. Um, you know, Stefan, do your customers have the variety and cost points uh, that they want to see in terms of equipment and, and, and devices to run on that network? Um, are things still evolving? You know, um, what do you see there? Yeah, that is um, yeah, the most critical point um, in, in private networks. So we, we see a very evolving ecosystem on the uh, end devices for 5G SA, but uh, that's not all. So we need also the capability of the end devices uh, for purposes uh, to work um, on the relevant PLMN ID. So we see, uh, for example, um, uh, in smartphones, laptops, here uh, or tablets. Um, here uh, is the, the 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 number of uh, potential devices, uh, not very large. That is one aspect. The second aspect is many of them can't work with the mobile quantity code uh, 999, uh, which is uh, relevant for the campus networks and also not for the um, uh, second um, um, mobile quantity code, the 26298. So um, that is the most critical point so that we try to test uh, which end device could work with which network. So um, here's um, many to do. And yeah, so um, we work on that. Okay, so it sounds like it sounds like they they could use some more variety. So hopefully that we'll continue to see that uh, develop. Um, Jim, I want to ask you about Open RAN because <clears throat> we're seeing that sort of simultaneously develop, and I know there's interest, um, you know, for for using that uh, in private networks. You know, what do you see evolving in terms of ORAN progression, and um, and what implications that might have for for private networks in terms of deployment and testing? Yeah. So Open RAN has been progressing, and I think most people believe that the Open RAN will find a home in private networks first, um, as the larger public networks continue to grapple with all sorts of aspects of not only virtualizing the RAN environment, but then evolving from a from currently a purpose-built network environment many of them have. So ORAN is expected to be a component of the cost profile, right, by enabling a multi-vendor ecosystem. I think that's really the biggest value proposition most people get out of open RAN at this point. However, this will then require uh, either the managed service provider or a system integrator like Stefan to manage the regression testing aspect of the multi-vendor environment. And, and this is something that's brand new. And if you look at, if you, if you examine under the hood, some of the, some of the ORAN deployments that are going on, early ORAN deployments are going on, you see a lot of this challenge uh, where they're gluing together multi-vendor ecosystems to enable uh, you know, interoperability testing in effect. Uh, and it's got a lot of complexity to it, right? There's the, there's the centralized unit, there's the distributed unit, and then there's the radio unit. And all those have connections that need to be validated and verified. And then you have the whole system level view that needs to be validated. 
um, driving a lot of complexity there. You know, Viavi, Viavi has tools in this area that uh, can help uh, develop uh, and automate some of this testing, but it's moving from uh, relying on the vendor systems, vendor ecosystem to doing it, to moving into the, the folks in the private network or the folks managing the private network. So that's, a, that's the big change on ORAN, but it will find a home in private networks because it does bring the multi-vendor ecosystem and brings costs uh, into, into form. Um, we have one audience question that came in. Uh, and Jim, this one is for you. Uh, can you say anything about what type of applications are being used um, in high band in Japan? Yeah, um, so my understanding of it is it's, uh, it's in a manufacturing environment primarily. Uh, so on the factory floor in, um, in uh, you know, I, I don't know this firsthand, but I believe some of it is related to uh, safety safety sensors and things that would, would want to trip very quickly uh, in order to uh, avoid a, a situation. Um, so okay. that, that is probably the best I can do for the, the, ap the absolute end application. Okay. Interesting. Yep. It's interesting to me that, that's, that it's latency focused as opposed to capacity focused. That's uh, yeah. An, yeah. Yep. an interesting point there. It's a, it's a mix of both because you, you, you typically on a manufacturing environment floor, you have lots of IoT, you have lots of sensors, right? So there is the, there is the, the scale of the number of sensors that you have, none of them being terribly, terribly high band, but then you overlay that with the, with the mission safety aspect. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, Stefan, another question for you, and that is, how do you see private networks being deployed? Are they sort of being deployed as, as on-prem islands of, you know, of compute and wireless? Are they generally connected to maybe multiple branches of, you know, you know maybe retailer or banking outlets? Um, you know, how are you seeing them deployed in terms of architecture right now? And do you think that's going to evolve over time? Yeah, 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 some different aspects. So um, one, it depends on the experience of the customer. So we, we see some of the um, larger companies uh, yeah, have experience uh, with uh, 5G and SA uh, networks. Also, they, they deploy the third or, or, or fourth network here. Um, so, so these um, are much more experienced and uh, they are beyond the proof of concept state, um, but most of the companies um, yeah, um, deploying uh, the first network. And that means they start with one use case with a, a um, small area, um, coverage area. And uh, in, in many cases, they are um, yeah, isolated. Um, but uh, overall, we see uh, the, the general requirement is that um, all components should be on-premise, um, no, um, yeah, no, no, no software or hardware um, means uh, out of the campus. And um, yeah, that is the actual stage we see in the projects. Um, so let's, let's sort of take a, a broader view. We're, we're getting... Um, close to, to the end of our session here. But I wanna ask both of you, um, you know, how much do companies that want to deploy private networks need to know about RF, about network core operations? Uh, and is that a barrier to adoption at this point? Um, you know, and then I, I think sort of the, the, the follow-up to that is then what areas of deployment or testing do you think are ripe for, for simplification? Um, and Stefan, I'm gonna start with you and then we're gonna to come to Jim. Um, yeah, areas for simplification. So the requirement from the customer is um, that the, the network must be easy, easy to handle uh, like Wi-Fi. So that is one of the most important aspects. And here we have many work uh, on all one um, specific networks because um, more, more complexity and uh, more capabilities for configuration um, means uh, the, the end customer um, um, yeah, must 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 bring more experience on the RF side and also on the management uh, for the for the networks. So that is um, yeah the aspects we see actually, uh, which means um, typically these companies uh, work together with uh, third party um, like an SI. Um, yeah. Okay, and Jim, your thoughts on uh, on how much they need to know and and what 
what you're trying to simplify. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, I, I was going to be a little bit repetitive, but I mean, this is the exact same areas that I've talked about already. Um, it's the regression testing aspect of this is huge, and and we shouldn't and we shouldn't uh, belittle that at all. Um, and making that as automated as possible around a set of test cases that can give you virtual certainty that pushing software upgrades to your network will allow it to continue to operate will be one key area. I think the, the scary RF part of it will be, I think you'll see a higher percentage of networks managed uh, by other parties like a, like a Mugler, for example. Uh, well, they'll turn the control and management of the RF portion of the network over to those folks to deal with it. And then the third one is the enhanced KPI and tracking of that RF environment with probes and things of that nature uh, to help, uh, uh, you know, essentially watch over the RF environment, especially in the areas where it's mission critical, where the where the wireless is uh, is in critical zones that are very important to the business environment and have SLAs associated with them. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you both so much for the time this morning. And uh, I really appreciate the perspective. And hopefully we've given our audience, audience some, uh, some real world examples and things to think about in terms of private network deployment and testing. Thank you both. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much.